Welcome to worship this day, whatever day it happens to be that you are watching this, we welcome you to worship at Providence Presbyterian Church. Would, um, we've got a few announcements we need to make, and I'd like to remind of the session that we do have a session meeting on Sunday the 16th. Uh, we begin at 1230. Uh, you'll be receiving your Zoom invite that morning, so please join in and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be ready to roll. Thank you very much for that. I would ask the congregation to keep Marion Bigham's family in your prayers. Uh, she passed away on Wednesday, the 12th of August. Uh, services will be on Saturday, um, August the 15th at one o'clock. Uh, they will be family only services. Um, and um, we just simply ask that uh, you keep both family and friends uh, in, in your prayers. I know many of you knew Marion and had great respect for her, um, great appreciation for her gifts and talents. And please, uh, hopefully you will remember her fondly and uh, again, continue to keep the family in your prayers. I think Lal has a few announcements for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. Um, during coffee hour this Sunday uh, at 10, the topic will be um, um, our favorite hymns. The question is, what is your favorite hymn? Uh, maybe Amazing Grace or Holy, Holy, and Holy. Um, we are going to talk about our favorite hymns and, and the role of hymns during this pandemic. Everyone is invited. We may sing one or two hymns uh, via Zoom. It'll be fun. Um, and please mark your calendar uh, for the fall kickoff. Um, fall kickoff is scheduled for uh, September 13th uh, this year. Uh, we are going to do it uh, digital. So this will be a digital fall kickoff. Um, children and families uh, will come and, and uh, in front of the CLC, uh, we'll set up a table. Of course, we'll practice social distancing. And we are going, it's Christian education and um, department and teachers are going to hand uh, muffins to children and families. Uh, so children uh, and parents, uh, please be ready. Um, the date is September 13th. And also the first uh, sun, uh, the first day of Sunday school is scheduled for September 20th. Um, the Christian Education Department is going to let us know how um, classes will meet. So more information will come. And there is a small group for everyone. Small groups are still active, very active. Um, um, so small groups like Generation X and Y meet on Friday nights at 10 on 9 p.m men's group meet uh, the first and um, uh, third Sunday of the month, third Friday of the month at 7 uh, a.m. And groups like Stephen Ministers and other groups meet as well. If you're interested in part of the small groups, uh, you can um, contact the church office. Thank you. The young university professor, C.S. Lewis, was beginning to feel the call of God bearing down upon his life. He preferred his freedom, or what he thought to be freedom, to any acceptance of Christianity, but God seemed ever present to him. Unable to go on with his ordinary duties, he put them aside, and during the Trinity term in 1929, Lewis knelt down and prayed and confessed that God really is God. In due course, he and his brother left on a Sunday morning by motorcycle for Whipsnade Zoo. When we set out, said Lewis, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. The long journey into light had finished and also begun. As we worship this day, May we find that our long journeys into light have both finished and are just beginning. Let us worship the Lord who is light and life and full of everlasting love. Let us worship. Amen.
Let us pray. We have heard it said, O God, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But what does that mean? We are not all that sure about what we are to hope for, and we are convinced only that seeing is believing. With our questions and skepticism, faith seems a remote possibility at best. But we have come to, you to worship you, the unseen God. Something has drawn us to you. Some hope has brought us to this time to seek you or perhaps be found by you. Perhaps it is a hope of finding meaning or peace or an inexplicable love that touches our heart and begins to heal our pain. We hope for a better world and to be better people. And we hope that your grand story of love, forgiveness, and newness of life is the unseen truth that will one day be as obvious as the noses on our faces. We hope, O oh God, in you. We believe, O oh Lord, help our unbelief. We look to your Son, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and ask that in this time of worship, he would water and nourish the seed within us, that it would bear the fruit of faith in all our living. Amen. Our morning psalm today comes from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Harmon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained blessing. Life forevermore. St. Paul sets the stage for our confession. While writing to the church in Ephesus, Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And to be belabor the point, he says it again, For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. We are shown mercy, made alive, salvage, and loved all by grace. And it is by grace we can confess our sins, and through faith we can receive that forgiveness God graciously gives. Let us pause for a silent confession and then prayer. Let us pray. When our faith is fickle and gets lured away by the idols of our age, forgive us, Lord. When our faith is passive and timid, when our faith lacks fortitude and falters, forgive us, Lord. When our faith asks too little for others and doesn't really believe it will come and all too easily gives up even asking, forgive us, Lord. When we build our faith on personal piety, when we measure our faith by spiritual worthiness and not wholly on your grace, forgive us, Lord. 
When our faith is not fed with your word and our obedience, forgive us, Lord. Fill our faith with your faithfulness, Lord. Embolden our asking with your generosity. By your grace, plant the seeds of faithful living and fruitful, believing deep in the soil of our souls. All this we ask in the name of the faithful one, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. And sisters and brothers, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Beloved, this good news, trust its truth and live the saving, forgiving, empowering love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, now and always. Amen. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 15 verses 10 through 20 then he called the crowd to him and said to them listen and understand it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person but it is what comes out of the mouth 
that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi there, everybody. I hope wherever you are and whenever you see this, you're having a good day. We may not have a beautiful weather day today, but it's going to be a good day. Sometimes, though, we can ruin a good day. You know, everybody does bad things sometimes. Maybe you don't mind your parents. You might take some cookies without asking. Maybe you don't get along with your brothers and sisters or your friends. You might get jealous sometimes. Well, there's a story in the Bible, and it's about Joseph and his 11 brothers. Yes, I said 11 brothers. And all those 11 brothers thought that Joseph was their father's favorite, and that made them jealous. They did worse than argue with their brother. They did some terrible things to Joseph because of their jealousy. But you know what? In the end, God chose Joseph to have great power over the land and over his brothers. And he could have taken his revenge on them. He could have punished them. But he didn't. Because God also gave Joseph the grace to lead those brothers to change their hearts and to change their ways. And they became a family again. He let them get back to a good place where they could be part of the good work that God was doing. That story about Joseph's forgiveness tells us and shows us what God's forgiveness of us is about. Sometimes like Joseph's brothers, we get jealous and that can make us do bad things and when we do something wrong it hurts our hearts and it hurts god's heart too let me give you an example let's say i go out on the playground because i want to swing with my favorite friend but when i get there that friend is swinging with someone else i get my feelings hurt i'm a little jealous and I do a bad thing. You know what? I push her off that swing and then I jump in and take her place. Well, for a moment, that makes me pretty happy. But when I see my friend that's on the ground crying, I can't enjoy being on the swing. And it hurts my feelings even more because I'm very sorry that I hurt my friend. What can I do? Well, what I hope I would do is get off that swing and do two important things. First, I say I'm sorry to my friend. And then I help my friend up and ask, can we all play together? And this time you get in the swing and I'll push. I show her I'm sorry. 
and when she forgives me, we all play together, and that makes my heart happy. God made us all with clean hearts, and God wants us to keep them clean by making good choices. Now, that story about the playground, I would not have been making a good choice. And I found out that hurt my heart. But when things like that happen, there's something I can do. I can tell God about it and God ask God to help me to be kind so that I won't hurt my friends. So today, I want to ask you that any time you think you might have done something to hurt somebody else, do those two things. Go ask your friend for forgiveness and make it right with your friend. But most of all, go to God to ask for forgiveness because God always forgives and God always gives us clean hearts. So everybody have a beautiful day. gospel reading uh, for today uh, with uh, Matthew 15 verses 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me Lord son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he, he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from, from the table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we too be healed this day. Allow your word to penetrate our hearts, to cleanse them, so that the words that come from our mouths might be encouraging and loving and inspirational and wise. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. There is a column in the Christian Century magazine uh, titled, How My Mind Has Changed. The editors invite mostly theologians and pastors and writers of a certain age to think back and ruminate for about 2,000 words or so about where they've come from and what they've come to in their thinking, mostly on matters of faith. One thing out of the many that I've learned from these columns is that these heavyweights in the field change their minds and alter their views and opinions. And that this may not be such a bad thing. And in fact, being of a certain age now, it might be a good exercise for me to go back and to look and see how my mind has changed over the years. Hopefully, it has. But I think Matthew could have inserted a subtitle right here and begun that very column. How my mind has changed. Because that is exactly what is happening to Jesus. Here, we get to watch Jesus change his mind. My wife's last year of teaching was not an easy one. Not only did things finish rather anticlimactically due to the pandemic, and not only was it difficult to shift from in-person teaching to doing so virtually, and add to that, four different preparations and one of those was for a class that she'd never taught before 
African American studies. Fortunately, she did, did have some good background. She had gotten her master's degree in American studies and had written her thesis on the music of the civil rights era. So the subject matter was not totally unfamiliar, but the subjects, that is the students, at least some of them, well, that proved to be another matter. Several of them were not the tell us what we have to know for the test sort of students, but had a genuine and crucial interest in this class as if it were the most important thing of all. And because of that interest, they had not just a few things to say about the subject matter. And speak they did, and it kept my wife on her toes, and with her nose into research, into what they were saying, not only to verify the facts and their opinions, but also to learn. She listened and she learned. Those, I believe, are the first steps to having your mind changed. So, let's turn to the scripture and let's watch Jesus as he listens, as he learns, and as he has his mind changed. So Jesus leaves and he goes away to Phoenicia, the district of Tyre and Sidon. Location, 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 as they say in real estate. Because Jesus, you see, is now in Gentile territory. And a non-Jew, a Gentile woman, worse, she is described as a Canaanite. Now that's a term used mainly in the Hebrew scriptures. And it describes groups of folks that were settled in the promised land and with whom the Jews were to have no association. They were idolaters. They worshipped many gods. They practiced numerous rituals and rites to ensure fertility, good weather, abundant crops, and winning the lottery. Well, I just threw that in there to see if you were really listening. But it is interesting that this term is hardly ever used in the New Testament. So that when we see it here, well, we might put it this way. There are Jews, God's chosen people, through whom God will bring the world to rights and establish God's kingdom. And then there's everybody else. But the everybody else is categorized as fathers. There were Gentiles, some of whom were actually proselytes of, Ju of Judaism. But then there were pagans. And there's not much good to be said about them. Lowest of all were the Canaanites ancient enemies of Israel. So this Canaanite woman comes out and she starts shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. And the di disciples were all thinking, well, what do you expect? She's a Canaanite. But she's shouting, and she's shouting to Jesus. And she knows that he is the Jewish Messiah because she calls him son of David. And she must know, or believe at least, that, that he can do something about her daughter. And she shouts. And the implication is that Jesus is not deaf to her shouting, but that he hears, he listens, but he says nothing. Why is he silent? Why? You know, Jesus always has a retort. He always has an answer. He always has a thought or a parable or something to say, but not here. He does not answer at all. Nor does he answer the disciples when they come to him and say, get rid of her. She is shouting at us now. She's one Canaanite woman making a ruckus over one crazed daughter and we're tired of all the screaming and the protest and the unruly uprising she's causing. Send her away so we can get on with our mission. He responded, the text says, but Greek scholars tell us that we can't really tell to whom Jesus is responding. To her? To the woman? To the disciples? The text does not say and it may not say on purpose. It seems that Jesus isn't responding to anyone in particular, but he is thinking. He is calling to mind what he believes his mission is. He has heard the woman's plea. She wants help for her daughter. 
And Jesus is nothing if he is not full of compassion. But he thinks, and he even says it out loud. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Torn between his desire to help on the one hand and his understanding of his mission as being exclusively to the Jews on the other. I wonder, I wonder if Jesus is recalling that when he sent out his 12 disciples in mission back in Matthew chapter 10, he gave them these instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. So what does that make Jesus? Provincial at best, at worst, a racist. At best, the Gentiles are seated at the back of the salvation bus, waiting and hoping that it will take them home to the kingdom after all the chosen are dropped off first. Jesus offers the water of life but it flows from the Jews only water fountain. And the disciples want Jesus to call in the troops and put an end to this unrest so things can get back to normal. But what is normal for them discriminates against all others. Their normal is based on excluding others. They must keep others out to maintain their privilege as the chosen race. And they've done it for so long. They are unaware, unconscious of what they are doing and the damage it causes. And Jesus wonders about this. Was I sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Jesus had heard the woman and he'd heard the disciples and now he is listening to his own thinking and learning, learning. And the woman comes along and becomes his teacher, a very respectful teacher. She bows before him and says, Lord, help me. She has called him son of David. She knows he is the Messiah to the Jews. But she also knows he can help, that he is compassionate. And now she appeals to him on that basis. And the crisis for Jesus gets more pointed. Will he remain racist? It certainly seems so with his next utterance. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. The woman wants help. But she is an immigrant, and she'll be taking a miracle away from a citizen who wants one. It is not fair to throw American jobs to illegal aliens, is it? But then again, was it fair to arrest black men on the flimsiest of charges and throw them into prison so there would be plenty of cheap labor for the building of roads and bridges and tunnels and the hoeing of gardens and painting of houses of the warden and his friends. And now we are doing what Jesus was doing. We are thinking. And we need teachers like that woman who will help us think outside the boxes we've grown up in and gotten so comfortable in. The children's food belongs to the children. That is true. And it is not fair to take it from them and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Gentiles were derogatorily referred to as dogs. But the word Jesus uses here for dog means puppy or house dog. The woman, perhaps seizing on this little give on Jesus' part, uh, not dog dog, but a house dog, a pet, a dog that is already in the house. Ah, she was 
thinking we're not outside, we're inside. And if we are inside, well, we too can get fed. And at the very least, we can lick the crumbs that fall from the table. We got a chance to spend a few days with our grandkids and we'd happened to take our dog along who gained several pounds eating scraps from the table where the nine month old sat in his high chair and cleared his plate every few minutes by throwing it all on the floor. Ah yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. Martin Luther says of this verse, isn't this a masterpiece? She traps Jesus in his own words. How can Jesus get out of this? The Canaanite woman teacher has taught Jesus well. If this is his father's world, there is more than enough for the children and the dogs. But that is not putting it quite right because Jesus turns to the woman and says, woman, not dog, not even house dog, not Canaanite, not pagan, nor even Gentile woman. Woman, she is in. There are now no second class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. She believed it all along and she wasn't going to let Jesus off the hook. She believed it for the sake of her daughter. Great is your faith, said Jesus. Let it be done for you as you wish. You, you, you. Jesus is pointing his finger at her. You are the one. How Jesus' mind has changed and expanded. And it would continue to expand even further as evidenced by his prophecy and when I am lifted up on the cross, that is, I will draw all to myself. And again, when he gives the great commission to the disciples, go now into all the world, baptizing and teaching, not just to the lost sheep of Israel, to all, all. And none are second class citizens in the kingdom of God. Consequently, none should be treated as such in the world today. For even today, the kingdom has arrived. St. Paul admonishes us all. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. All of you are heirs according to the promise. Jesus had his mind changed by a Canaanite woman. I wonder who might come along and change our minds. Who will challenge? Who will teach us? And will we listen? I don't know why, but for some reason I have... I don't know, I've just started writing limericks just to see if I could do it, I think. And I, I have this one on Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Foreign woman shouting rather loud, haughty and acting quite proud, as if she were one of us and deserved help from Jesus, who said, no, only Israelites allowed. It is entirely unfair, he said, to take food from the child and instead toss it on the floor for the dogs. Ah, she said, your memory let me jog. The dogs get the crumbs from the bread. No wonder your voice was raised. Your great faith is to be praised. Let it be done as you wish, served up on a fine china dish. And the demons left her daughter unfazed. Amen.
Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Good and gracious God, so many of your people are hurting. There seems no end in sight to the uncertainty and pain of this season. Parents and caregivers are worried about their children's well-being as the school year approaches and the pandemic persists. Those living in group care facilities yearn to be able to have visitors again, and the loneliness of those already isolated grows. The economic fallout from this virus gets deeper and wider as many scramble to find work and put food on the table. It feels at times as if we call out to you and you do not respond. Like the Canaanite woman, we shout for mercy, but we receive no help. Yet she kept calling out to you, kept following you, refused to be turned away until you healed her daughter. We call out to you now, Lord Christ, have mercy on us. Hear our cries, help us. We call out for mercy for those on the front lines of fighting for justice. We call out for mercy for those on the front lines of fighting this pandemic. We call out for mercy for those grieving the death of loved ones. We call out for mercy for the sick and those who tend them. We call out for mercy on behalf of those who do not have the strength to raise their own voices. We call out for mercy for ourselves. Trusting you, you know our deepest needs, even if we do not have the wisdom to name them. When we fear, Lord, you have walked away from us in our desperation. Send your Holy Spirit to remind us yet again that God does not reject God's people, that the call and gifts of God are irrevocable. Embed in us the biblical stories that teach us that even that which we intend for evil, you, Lord God, use for, God, for good. Grant us the faith of the Canaanite woman so that we will persist in advocating for the vulnerable and hurting, no matter how long it takes for our world to be made well. Give us faith, Almighty God, to keep focus on our Savior, following the way, loving you and our neighbors, until the one we worship comes again, and come again, he will. We make our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We thank our Reverend Jill Duffield, for, uh, uh, Duffield from uh, the Presbyterian Outlook for sharing uh, the people, uh, uh, people's prayer. And friends, uh, Christ has provided us from his own table of blessings, anointing and abundance overflows let us offer our gifts together from the bounty he has given us let us give our tithes and offerings to the lord
let us affirm what we believe. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And friends, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God has gifted you with forgiveness and grace you with reconciliation. Go now and share God's gifts with the distressed and estranged. Christ has called you close to Him and healed you from torment. Go now and call others to receive Christ's mercy and healing. The blessing of God, source of life, power of life, redeemer of life, be with you now and always. Amen.